Welcome to Ferment Radio, a podcast series on bacterial and social fermentation. Fermentation can incite social action, spark creativity and bring surprising new tastes to our lives. My name is Aga Vokrywka and I invite you to join us in a conversation on living interconnectivities. From macro to micro, from cellular to societal and from global to personal. been rare, expensive and only accessible to the wealthy. The revolution of white bread as we know it, from elite to common popularity, became symbolic of the success of industrialization and capitalism. The shift towards industrialized white bread was meant to produce a society which could be efficient, controllable and clean. With that idea in mind, purity would reduce diversity and create a world that could be easier to understand and control. Different ideas about food and eating can actually change our understanding of society and have a strong influence on how we live our lives. Fermentation questions purity. It needs bacteria to grow. And in our society, bacteria are seen as something unclean. Can fermentation, which goes against separation, control and boundary making, help create a healthier society? Our guest Stephanie Maroni, a scholar of feminist food studies, might not have a straight answer to this and other questions. Nevertheless, she has a great deal to say about how science uses colonial practices in order to find solutions to Western problems. Particularly with the extraction of ancestral microbes from Hadza people, an indigenous ethnic group in north central Tanzania. But first, how would Stephanie describe herself in her own words? I guess I would describe myself as a, um, you know, I'm a scholar of food studies and feminist science and technology studies. I'm uh, a fermenter. I like to make and ferment various things. And I'm trained as a um, kind of interdisciplinary humanist. So my background is in literature and cultural studies and material studies. And I'm interested in collaborative, creative work with other people that centers arts and humanities approaches, but has a really broad query. You know, I really like to look at science and technology and more than human worlds, but maybe using the methods of the arts and humanities to get there. I know that in your work, you've been uh, quite much impacted by Sandor Katz. I I first came to Sandor's work because um, I was a PhD student here at University of California, Davis, where I got my PhD. And during my research, I, um, I was kind of interested in the way that different food reformers, we could call them, used food as a way to imagine uh, different worlds, or conversely, like tried to enact new worlds by thinking that they could change ideas about food, that somehow by changing ideas about food and eating, we could actually change ideas about society. And this is, a you know, in the context I was studying, I was looking really at people in the United States and North America in uh, the 20th century, uh, who were, you know, trying to come up with new ideas of nutrition and formalize ideas of eating because they felt that it was a, very much about making certain kinds of subjects that were amendable to being a part of a diverse, you know, <laughs> citizenry of the United States. And for better or for worse, you know, there's a, there's a lot of critical work in there. And I was curious about that, uh, that kind of work drawing on Michel Foucault and ideas about governance of the self and uh, how that gets enacted through the state. 
So that was my my headspace when I uh, found out about uh, Sander Katz because I started to read Wild Fermentation. So my initial approach was, oh, this is interesting. I could maybe take what I've been thinking and studying about these, you know, mid 20th century reformers, early 20th century, and um, look at what that is uh, in the context of fermentation now. And so the opportunity to do a residency at the Foundation for Fermentation Fervor, (laughs) which is kind of his name for his teaching space in um, Tennessee that came up for a three-week residency in 2014. And I applied and I was accepted. So it was just so joyful to live outside, mostly outside. You know, we camped and Tennessee is so beautiful. It's it's hot at that time of the year, but it's just incredibly beautiful. I saw, um, you know, lightning bugs for the first time in my life. And I uh, was able to just appreciate the landscape and learn from others and uh, ultimately gain a much better understanding of Sanders' place and the role of fermentation in the network of queer intentional communities. It's not, you know, Narnia. It's <laughs> it's a real place where uh, people live and they um, negotiate what it means to live collectively. And there are many other little communities that make up this network and some are people's individual homes. It's not all, you know, collaborative, collective living. Um, And it helped me really, it helped me really understand what Sander was doing in wild fermentation, especially Um, that it was not just about an idea of the world where everybody ferments foods because wouldn't that be great? But it was, he was really articulating and theorizing through fermentation what it means for him to live in connection to other people, the the actual other people that he shared his life with at that time, as well as the land and the water and the microbes and the animals. And I found all that reflected in my experience there. I wonder how would you describe this relationship between like a fermentation as a practice and and yeah like social justice gender equity or queerness um in terms of queerness you know i find that queerness helped me articulate what was so compelling about this look at a more than human world and why i think microbes are so interesting is <laughs> probably because inspired by queer theorists and honestly by the lived realities of a lot of queer people who create new kinds of kinship and family making practice as a way to survive and and create belonging. Um, I find it interesting when I can make an analogy to the way that microbes live and interact with one another. And, you know, it's not to like anthropomorphize what microbes do or to say that they have a a gender, you know, or an identity, but the fact that they swap genes all the time and they really like kind of defy and resist uh, attempts to categorize them as species, right? If we're using, um, you know, DNA analysis, right? If, if a microbe is constantly swipping or swapping genes with other microbes, uh, you can't really call it a species through that particular way of knowing. And uh, they eat and digest one another. <laughs> you know, they, um, they have a kind of transmutability to them that uh, is so fascinating to me and provides such an interesting um, inspiration for thinking of like how we all might live and how we might all practice things like identity. You also said before that social change could be achieved by changing our ideas about food. I totally agree with you, but I wanted to come up here together with an example of some maybe prejudice which could be changed in order to yeah shift something on a societal level. Yeah, well actually I have, you know, from my studies in food studies, I have examples of ones that I I don't particularly like. (laughs) So, but those are, they're illustrative anyway, that, um, you know, for a a lot of, and this is kind of drawing on the work of um, Aaron Bobra Strain and E. Melanie Dupuy, who are both food studies scholars that have written about these topics of, um, and also my, my advisor, Charlotte Biltikoff wrote a book about this as well, that 
uh, food reformers. And, and this is really at a time when like things like housework and um, sanitation, cleaning were becoming professionalized. And, um, and we had the growth of the industrial food system in the United States. And at, at this time, there was, um, you know, and this idea that what people were eating and how they were eating and how they were living was shaping the kinds of people that they were or the people that they were becoming, you know, and it's, it's actually closely tied to the rise of eugenics as well. Um, and not just that we could, you know, change people through their genes by controlling their reproduction, but we might also change people by changing their environments. And it was, um, you know, the idea of euthenics, which was a, a kind of um, partner to eugenic movement. And so some of these, uh, you know, largely young women um, or educated older women that like weren't allowed into mainstream scientific projects or, or like actively kicked out of them, uh, turned to things like domestic science or domestic housework to bring scientific ideas uh, to those fields and professionalize them and validate them. And um, part of that movement was to uh, say, okay, well, what if we could, you know, help women, help, you know, largely poor women, rural living women, or um, women of color at the time, immigrant women, to eat in a more quote unquote American way or um, eat foods that we now understand are nutritious because of the rising science of nutrition at that time, you know, would that produce different kinds of people? And for example, in Aaron Bobrow Strain's book, he outlines this dynamic through bread, you know, and that the, the shift toward an industrial white bread that was processed, that was, you know, um, made in sterile facilities. Um, the idea was that that would you know, produce a body, produce a citizenship that was efficient, clean, um, you know, nourished in the way that we understand nutrition and science at the time. And, uh, but what ultimately would be removed from practices of tradition or handmade food um, that, that at the time there was the idea that that was kind of culturally uh, that the people who clung to traditions would never kind of assimilate into a larger uh, quote unquote American culture. So those, I think, are that's the perspective I have kind of that is always in my mind when um, I hear about people who strongly believe that if we change the way we eat, we could become different kinds of people and thus a different kind of society. I think that there's a lot of negative examples of how that has been done, particularly when it aligns with like dominant or hegemonic scientific practices or the state, you know, trying to control people. So I turn to fermentation with a kind of question of like, is there something in this practice that can do this interesting project of changing the way we relate to each other, to ourselves, to our landscapes? and maybe produce larger social change, you know, through the practices of making, consuming, and sharing fermented foods. So that's, you know, I'm still asking myself that question. I don't, I don't really have an answer. I like to believe, you know, yes, but um, a call to build community, you know, through fermentation or produce new ideas about social arrangements through our fermented fermentation practices. It's not a call that's for everybody. <laughs> not everyone will be compelled by it or interested by it. And it's really important that these things not be universal, which is what I think some of the earlier food reformers wanted and, and believed is um, that these were universal ideas about goodness and purity. And I wanted to reject that and um, just maybe put out a call to people who are either already have a fermentation practice, but we're looking for ways to broaden their understanding of why that is an important part of their life and their community. And maybe, you know, ideally isn't just focused on one's individual health um, or for people who that are already doing the work of social change and community building and that fermentation might be a new practice they could bring in 
to, um, you know, revive and support one another in new ways. Why, why did it happen so? Where, where is this idea of pureness and kind of also white sugar, right? Like white bread became so strong in a especially Western culture, or I guess that it is derived from there. Where is the origin of this pureness, whiteness? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a great question and, and a big question of like, where do, where does the Western foundation of purity come from? And purity is just such a big concept and it can mean so many different things. And so maybe being more specific about purity in the realm of um, focusing and controlling what goes into the body, which is what I think where food can come in and where fermentation is an interesting example of this or an interesting challenge to purity. And um, I really appreciate and am inspired by the work of the feminist philosopher Alexa Shotwell, who wrote a book called Against Purity. Part of, you know, Shot what Shotwell tries to outline there is that purism and purity, which has, you know, deep origins in Western and European culture from many different places, some of them religious, political, social, but purism is really an approach to trying to reduce the complexity of the world and trying to um, take diverse you know, even contradictory, confusing um, realities about the world and reduce them into something that can be understood, but that can also be controlled fundamentally. And so purism works by um, bifurcating, you know, creating um, dualities, either ors, and uh, the us and them. It Uh, inside outside I know I can keep coming up with these um and that purity uh is also really kind of hyper focused on the individual right that it's about controlling the inside outside the us and them controlling the boundaries of the individual because for something to be pure it assumes that that it is somehow unpolluted or uncontaminated by others or other things broadly and that whole you know, that whole approach to the world is one that has really proceeded along with, you know, industrialism and the idea that you can break the world down into indiscreet parts and control and replace them, you know, as needed. Uh, it has definitely proceeded in the realm of food politics. And I think that the world we live in right now around food politics or food um, food consumption and the way we maybe talk about it in our broader North American culture is uh, that it's really hyper-focused on individual choice and control, and which is kind of a part of a broader neoliberal uh, understanding of how one is supposed to interact with the world. Um, but for me, I'm interested in seeing how how that can is what I think is maybe the root of a lot of problems in uh, the way we think about our relationship to food and eating, the way we think about our relationship to other people, and um, definitely a broader just political problem <laughs> that we need to uh, we need to address because at its core it really is about separation uh, and control and boundary making and uh, fermentation you know, destroys all of those things. <laughs> and that's why it's such an interesting thing to think with against purity, you know. Here I would like to refer to the, um, to the essay or text you have written uh, about kind of exploiting human flora of indigenous people. I would maybe shorten, if I would need to put it in one sentence, probably it would sound like this. Could you in, in short tell that story? This, this all started for me with, um, you know, my dissertation topic is on human microbiome science. And I was interested, I, I actually got to know some researchers at UC Davis and I found their work really interesting. And I, um, I started to understand the world a little bit more of how, well, how scientists were categorizing this, this idea. It's almost, you know, funny how much I've normalized the concept, but at the time it really like, you know, shocked my world that 
that actually, you know, our bodies are covered in microbes and that the genetic makeup of our human bodies, if you look at the genes, are largely microbial, you know, and and more we are more than human. You know, our bodies are multi-species bodies. And I found that so fascinating. And I also found that thinking that way, there was so much potential in there to challenge what I had seen, you know, coming off of our previous uh, conversation there around this idea that that human bodies could be pure and could we could, you know, really draw a border around inside outside and that we can control as individuals, you know, what comes into our body and how it gets processed and really mediate the world, you know, it, with a sense of control and how um, the very fact that there are, you know, <laughs> microbes doing their thing without our consent all over our body, you know, really shattered that promise of total control uh, and total kind of purity of the inside and outside. So I wanted to know more about what these folks were doing. And uh, at that time, uh, these kind of citizen science projects were also coming to real popularity. The, you know, the idea that you would, um, you know, like home genetic testing and that you would contribute your own materials to a larger scientific project. And, uh, you know, that was, it was interesting. And I, and I definitely talked to scientists who told me how like revolutionary that would be for the collection of data and sharing data. And, um, but also part of me was like, well, that's kind of scary. And I, you know, wonder, uh, you know, looking at feminist science studies, people who had, for example, looked at the case of Henrietta Lacks, who, um, you know, whose um, cells were taken from her when she was being treated for cancer and now, you know, are the basis of the way we do cancer and other cellular research in the United States. And so I started to then get concerned about extraction and control and profiteering off of other people's um, bodily materials or microbes. And the, in that that world of thought and thinking, I came upon the work of uh, a researcher named Jeff Leach, who um, I'm very interested in him as a figure. And he, uh, I honestly, you know, think he's a bit of a huckster, a bit of a con man. And he at the time was aligned with this group uh, called the American Gut Project, which was seeking samples from people as a citizen science project. Uh, and they would, you know, take your fecal sample and and put it through their um, metagenomic analysis <laughs> and tell you what kinds of microbes were in your feces, but, you know, by your gut, by way of your feces. So um, I kind of had my eye on Leach because he had a blog at the time. And that blog was um, chronicling his exploits around the world um, in the world, in the realm of human microbiome science and, um, fecal transplants at the time were also becoming much more widely discussed and, and, and people were fascinated by them. Uh, the idea that you could take healthy, you know, fecal material and bring that into someone's body, whether by, you know, an enema or by a pill, and it might actually help repopulate some of the, um, microbes in their gut and help to cure different kinds of, or ease different kinds of digestive issues. But um, Leach at the time was uh, going to Tanzania to study the Hadza people. And the way, I was just struck by the way he was categorizing the work that he was doing there. And uh, he, he was a part of you know, it wasn't just Leach as an individual, as an outsider, you know, he was a part of a much bigger uh, group at that time that was publishing a lot and uh, in scientific journals, but also writing popular press books that um, in particular, I'm talking about Martin Blazer's book, Missing Microbes, and how they were all kind of constructing this shared narrative that, you know, Western people uh, we're kind of in, uh, Blazer called it like the nose, the no man's land, the danger zone, you know, between this world of our quote unquote ancient microbiome and the modern world. And they were starting to, you know, at the time, draw correlations between 
um, things that Blazer was calling modern plagues, like um, the rise of asthma and allergy and different kinds of um, digestive disorders. And at the time, even autism, they were looking at its relationship to, you know, the gut microbial composition. And they kind of landed on the idea that our industrialized food system was um, that was reliant on processed or packaged foods had kind of like robbed, you know, or impoverished our guts of diverse microbiota that would um, ultimately help with the kinds of autoimmune disorders that we were seeing arise in at the time among Westerners. And so there's lots of ways to kind of explore that question scientifically. There's lots of ways to um, maybe come up with different kinds of therapeutics or to better understand the mechanisms, the relationships between autoimmune disorder and gut microbes. But this particular group that I kind of honed in on for my research and for my this article that you're referencing, um, they believed that the best way to approach this question was to find these quote unquote missing microbes to actually kind of pull or extract these ancient microbes from the land and bodies of quote unquote ancient people and repopulate them into Western bodies to cure at the time what they thought was a kind of rising um, problem of autoimmune disorders. So now you know, backing up a little bit as somebody who, as a, you know, someone who was very interested in the way that Western colonial science has always been a project of extraction and control, uh, tied to purity, tied to, you know, a kind of way, a uh, desire to take in all of the world and control it and categorize it and make sense of it through a very narrow um, understanding of the world, I saw a real parallel to what these scientists were doing with, um, you know, previous attempts to capture rubber plants, um, people (laughs) from the global South, from indigenous places and, um, use them, extract them and use them for the benefit of either with the Western colonial world or science in particular. And that was, um, you know, a big red flag, (laughs) something that I wanted to pay more attention to. So um, looking more closely then at Leach's experience and the way that he describes um, extracting, you know, fecal material from this Hadza man who was approximately his age. And, you know, he, he has a very sensationalist post about how he you know, inserts this fecal transplant uh, into his own body with a turkey baster and um, all in the hopes he's saying to, you know, like, quote unquote, become Hadza or uh, become more human and repopulate his white Western gut with the, quote unquote, ancestral microbes, you know, that the Hadza people share. And all of those things are just, they're really diminutive and primitive, like they, they make primitive, you know, these ideas of modern living indigenous people that are facing really different kinds of problems other than autoimmune disorders. And um, I'm sure would be interested in having Western scientists help them address the problems that they face as a community but none of that was kind of taken into consideration. It was, it was really all about this continued project to extract materials, in this case, materials from the living bodies of indigenous people, for the purpose of, you know, a potential therapeutic to treat Westerners. And um, so, I, you know, I have a lot more to say about how that's tied to like framings of modernity and Westernization and um, the weird self-making project that was going on with Leech and the kind of like desire for to become the other. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for me, I just thought that it was an, an interesting look at the way um, problems in human microbiome science were being framed and uh, were being answers and solutions were being delivered 
drawing on these really violent tropes from the broader project of Western colonial science. The reason, you know, the the Hadza people supposedly have these quote unquote, and I keep putting them in quotes because I really want to, I want people who are reading and listening to understand that like there is no ancient microbiome. There is no ancestral microbe that can be found in the body of a person in 2020. You know, like that's not possible. They're not time travelers. These are modern people living in the world as it is today. And their bodies are just as, you know, open and changed by their environments as ours are. So uh, all, all that to say, though, <laughs> that there, there are other ways to kind of cultivate diversity in the gut uh, to um, bring in new microbes and supposedly ones that are attached to greater health outcomes for humans. But that, you know, would require a lot of, you know, inconvenience maybe for people that are very used to filtered water and used to um, packaged foods and are used to taking antibiotics whenever they, um, you know, or their doctor prescribing them antibiotics when they don't feel great. And, there's, uh, you know, living inside homes without kind of a constant flow of microbes in the earth and on the air or not living with animals or not eating um, the um, rumen of different animals. So like eating the digestive organs of other animals. Maybe you already started to talk about it, how we could actually engage with our multi-species bodies. Overwhelmingly, I find that People are interested in this question because they have, they're tied to some idea about health. And that idea about health is ultimately, you know, tied to pretty kind of ableist understandings of what a body is supposed to look like, what um, health is supposed to mean in one's body, what it's supposed to feel like. And um, so that's, it's, it's so tricky to think, to talk and give advice or give, you know, even talk about what I do myself, because so much of the way we, we can even approach eating in, you know, modern US and North American culture is overwhelmed by this concept of health or healthism is the way I like to think about it, drawing on the work of Robert Crawford, that it, it just predominates how we think about eating and diets in the first place. And certainly a lot, I mean, I don't, I can hardly think of a counter example. Um, the work around microbes and fermented foods is pretty much overwhelmingly focused on ideas of health, or at least address ideas of health as like, that's why we eat fermented foods is because we want a more healthy microbiome. And, um, you know, if that's your goal, then you will, you know, go for it and try different eating and making different things. But a lot of the advice that you'll find in that world is still focused pretty narrowly on understanding health as tied to weight loss, you know, tied to um, getting control over your body and it's um, and the way it acts and reacts. And uh, ultimately, I think anything that's centered on control and manipulation is, um, you know, not that we don't need that sometimes in our life, especially, you know, right now I'm thinking about the political context, you know, there are so few things we can control. So I'm not saying that the world we don't need to have control built into our lives. I just mean that for me, I'm, I'm really interested in exploring how to do that kind of engagement with one's multi-species body that isn't centered on control. And, um, you know, so that, that has meant just kind of like, sometimes I just let my ferments go. Like I let them rot and not because I'm going to eat them, but I just am kind of, I want to understand what the process looks like beyond that optimal place in which I will enjoy it. Um, with my friends in the, my mushroom friends, <laughs> You know, we, we've been growing um, sheets of kombucha scobies and making different kinds of like fabric with it or art pieces with it um, and just kind of experimenting with what it looks like and how it feels if we do different things to it. And um, we've been like, you know, kind of looking and reading and trying to think about fermentation 
um, or, you know, our multi-species bodies. Like, what does that look like as a method for reading, for writing, for talking to other people, for doing politics, you know, trying to just broaden uh, all the different ways in which we might do this. And for me in particular, because it's the world I come out of, try not to focus or overly focus on eating, you know, as a practice to do that. Although it's a really wonderful practice to do that. And I really enjoy making and eating fermented foods. (laughs) It really is about becoming, um, actually the uh, Natasha Myers, another feminist science and technology studies scholar writes about becoming censor that we can, we can become through our practices, through our observations, through our, you know, through our noticing, we can become attuned to different ways of being in the world and the ways that other beings are in the world, if that makes sense. And I think that fermentation is a practice that can lead us to that and doesn't have to stay in the realm of food fermentation explicitly. That was Stephanie Maroney. I really recommend you to check out her article on Sanders Katz's queer fermentative praxis. You can find it online under Sander Katz and the possibilities of a queer fermentative praxis. Another great read you can find online is On Racial Constitutions and Digestive Therapeutics, a text that talks about fecal microbiota transplants and colonialist practices. This episode continues a series on Fairman Radio that focuses entirely on feminist issues. It is a sisterhood act of solidarity with Polish women and their protest against a law that prohibits abortion in Poland. If you would like to know more about the show, listen to this episode again, or find previous episodes, please go to fermentradio.com. You can subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and more. I'm always looking forward to hearing from you at hello at fermentradio.com. Ferment Radio is brought to you by Culture of Cultures and is produced by Super Eclectic. Thank you for listening. Keep fermenting and stay tuned for the next episode of Ferment Radio.